Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I'm your host, Scott Ramp. Are she new into the uh, kind of basically the week that kicks off the springtime? Uh, we got a lot of uh, news coming out of the world. Uh, one thing I'm definitely going to start off on is a little bit of uh, interesting news right here. This is Cicada. I stole that uh, uh, image from the internet, and I was able to. Uh, get a nice t-shirt in time just for this occasion. Just the, the fact that uh, uh, both a 17 year uh, and a 13 year brood is happening at the same time, effectively having about, just imagine trillions of cicadas, or if I were to break it up in better math, uh, just imagine 10 million cicadas coming out of a single acre of land and then multiply that by thousands. So it's ridiculous how much cicadas are coming out. Some of them are already starting to pop out here and there just for the uh, small chance to uh, breed with one another. And while doing so, they'll be creating quite a sound that got many people, especially in the South, calling the police for, well, what's going on? So yeah, there's definitely a lot going on today. And I'm going to uh, kick things off with some city council this week. It was a four hour plus meeting and they will have no meeting next week because it's the fifth Monday of the month. And usually they don't have uh, city council meetings on those days. This week highlights are the city consent agenda and he aimed to repeal an ordinance developers to clear out asbestos okay, because the state law is uh, going to be handling a lot of that through the Montana Department of Environmental Quality. Um, some, uh, some bed and breakfast is looking to grow their business on uh, uh, up near Poplar Street which gets interesting uh, uh, back and forth with a city council member as well. Mo uh, major funding for grants through the home CBDG, a uh, the American uh, Affordable uh, the AHTF, uh, which are aimed for urban development grants for funding. Another property subject rezoning was the 9th and uh, 8th and 9th streets just off of a reserve. Uh, so we're going to kick things off. Um, it's Sandra Vasica, uh, she talks about uh, uh, the urban camping and what the city is doing to help uh, curve some of those uh, trends here in the city of Missoula. There is an official form for um, reporting urban camping. And if you just uh, Google or use your favorite search engine to look up um, Missoula forms, urban camping reporting form, that is uh, the best way to get the urban camping, um, I guess, notice out to city officials. And they use that to, um, to basically decide, or not decide, but um, to figure out where there are um, areas that have the most amount of it and they're usually very very uh, fast at um, i guess uh, handling the issue and um, I, I would highly recommend using the actual form to uh, do that so if you just google missoula um, city of missoula urban camping reporting form that's the best way to uh, to report those okay and just so you guys know there are over 500 homeless individuals living in the city of Missoula. And for that form, I can show you the uh, sheet and you can go to the city of Missoula's website to find this form. If you are uh, interested and you want to report these kinds of things, you can talk about, you know, if you're in danger, they always that tell that you call 911. But if you notice uh, an encampment starting to form or a tent, you can type in your information, encampment information, the address, the location, description, this is very similar to what they do for uh, potholes for the chip and seal project through the city of Missoula, which basically says if you have a pothole and nothing's being done about it, you can use the form at the city of Missoula to uh, basically tattle in a way of potholes and homeless encampments. So uh, as we move on, we also get into property looking to update their zoning to allow for a bed and breakfast. Uh, Daniel Colleen of City Council brings up the point the property is in an area of a former graveyard. So here is Troy Savage responding to some of those concerns uh, on his property. The, uh, you know, we, we, we talked about this 20 years ago too. You know, same discussion, right? Because we put in a rock wall along it, stuff like that, so we had to excavate. And um, the graveyard, I don't know, don't have a slide of it, but it does cut the corner of the property, you know, the actual border of the graveyard. And what that really means, we don't really know. But um, when we put this apartment in, we are going to have to dig, and we're going to follow all the guidelines and rules of digging. It's an approved thing to do, but if we find something, we stop and let everybody know to come and check it out. That's the plan. All right, and then Daniel Carlino is still not completely convinced uh, by the response, and this is what he had to say. Like, reason local government shouldn't get in the way of people being able to do things with their property like this, but I, I, 
I feel like most of us would not accept developing over most people's graves. And I have a hard time making ex an exception um, for doing that in certain cases. And perhaps that's not even a criteria that's been allowed to be chosen on here. But um, for that reason, I don't think I can necessarily support this. Um, although I think everybody has got goodwill and good intent um, and people should just be able to, you know, build things on their property if they want to. But in this particular case over a grave site and a historical marker that we just established last year, um, I just don't feel comfortable. Yep. And that was just one of the many things because in the last uh, hundred so years, the city of Missoula have been kind of uh, tiptoeing around this subject when it comes to uh, essentially uh, they moved the gravestones, but they didn't move the bodies kind of situations. And of course, they approved this development with a soft, soft, a soft stop guarantee if bodies do come up, but it was unclear about the nature of intent, especially when it comes to the disrupting a site that may or may not still have human remains. Not a topic we can really tiptoe tip around, but the city tried their best. Uh, let's talk about asbestos and who is responsible. So Walter uh, Basinger, uh, community planning, talks about this new code update and the city uh, uh, basically removing the ordinance that requires developers to and uh, people de um, doing demolition to buildings to check for asbestos. Currently, the city of Missoula ordinance 3368, which was adopted in February 11th of 2008 and is included in Title 15, Sections 1532.010 E and H, requires persons applying for a building permit or a demolition permit to provide proof that a trained asbestos inspector has surveyed the area of the building affected by the proposed work before the building permit can be issued. Ordinance 3368 is duplicative of the state requirements regarding surveying and permitting with respect to state DEQ requirements. Upon review, the city of Missoula appears to be the only major municipality that has requirement to provide proof prior to issuance of a building or demolition permit. Bozeman, Billings, Helena, and Great Falls, as well as Libby, do not independently enforce DEQ requirements. They provide notification to the owner operator of DEQ requirements uh, in writing at the time of permitting. All right, but uh, one of the uh, public commenters is not quite convinced that uh, repealing this ordinance would uh, make sure that the developer would actually follow those rules uh, mandated by the state. Uh, so here's James Crosby, laborer, who talks a little bit more about this. With some experience in construction, I don't know of any contractors who will willingly take on extra costs on their project. And to include language that says very strongly, you should follow the rules, we mean it. I think, especially with Earth Day on our calendar right now, I think to have something that says you must follow the rules with no proof opens the door for reckless demolition and a lot of asbestos released into the environment. So it does slow down construction, it does slow down permitting, but we owe it to our earth to make responsible decisions and corporations and individuals have proven over and over again that without oversight and without accountability, unfortunately, we do not often make the right choices. All right. Then as we get further in down, uh, Christina Goddington, uh, a chief building official for Missoula, responds to those claims. And this is what she had to say. We do take asbestos control very seriously in Missoula and our inspectors in the field do still have the ability to request a copy of the asbestos report. Anytime we see somebody performing demolition work that might have asbestos requirements at play. Um, and we also have the ability to issue a stop work order and report them to the DEQ for non-compliance. And there already is, um, you know, a mechanism in place from the DEQ that will um, penalize people that are not uh, performing work in accordance with their regulations pretty quite heavily. Um, and they have administrative penalties up to $10,000 per day for violation up to a maximum of $80,000. Um, civil penalties up to $25,000 a day and criminal penalties um, that can result in a misdemeanor charge of $500. So I think there, there is a lot of um, 
there are a lot of mechanisms in place to keep contractors and uh, accountable and keep our um, community clean and safe. Yep. So asbestos is one of those old uh, insulator uh, chemicals that they found out, oops, caused cancer. And uh, no de de developers before 1989, I looked this up, have been able to work with asbestos. Even my own purchase of my own house uh, uh, back, and it was built in the 90s. Sorry, let me restart that. Even my purchase of my home, which was uh, built in the 90s, had uh, inspections for asbestos, in which when I did my signing, they uh, guaranteed that there was an asbestos check for that when I was uh, in the process of purchasing my house. And as we move on to the next topic, uh, um, um, we went through a lot of details for land use and zoning back and forth for a site being developed just off of Reserve Street through a dead end both on 8th and 9th Street. Uh, Reagan Calloway, resident off of 8th Street, is worried about the congestion on the residential neighborhood by just increasing density in the uh, uh, proposed area. I would like to encourage you guys to consider our vote consistently with what the planning board unanimously disagreed with it was a unanimous no and that was based upon some really simple things neighborhood safety and you've heard about 8th street 8th street you can barely get two cars in and out of 8th street on the reserve at the same time there's no way to go anywhere else because it's a dead end i go out i turn right i can't turn left so and that depends on the time of the day and i do it for in terms of statistics i do it about twice a day so i have a pretty good replication um it's a, it's difficult and dangerous egress and and ingress they also talked about neighborhood disruption and that is obvious it's going to be very disruptive to the neighborhood for all of the reasons stated and disruptive disruption of traffic on reserve street a state highway um that is one of the most difficult places to drive in general. There's no one in Missoula that would like to see Reserve Street more difficult. All right. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, Franklin to the Fort area, if you've ever driven in that area, take any kind of side streets, thinking that you can get onto major uh, roadways and then find yourself at many dead ends, and not, that's just not counting. 8th and 9th Street, which is a very fairly small area, just because uh, I've driven by, by there and it's like, oh yeah, it's interesting. It's kind of like they made 7th Street and they made some little cul-de-sacs just off of 7th Street, but then there's some extra land right there. And so when they go in there, it's like, there's a lot of just like, oh, you got to turn, then you got to turn back. And now you're on a main street to a main street. It's it's definitely a mess in a lot of those areas. Just be, and you know they also have to take into account the drainage ditch that kind of protrudes through there. Not to mention the train tracks. Yeah, Missoula's infrastructure is kind of weird in that general area as well. And anyone who turns left on reserve without a light is crazy. But I digress. Uh, Aiden Rodriguez, resident of 9th Street, also talks about the residential impact. Uh, with a uh, higher density and business. The potential residential traffic increase would double for the rezoning, allowing more than twice the amount of dwellings. Um, and the non-residential traffic would be exponentially increased with a large business. And to describe what non-residential traffic looks like in our neighborhood, it is people trying to avoid Highway 93 on Reserve Street and driving well over the speed limits and recklessly and getting frustrated when they realize that our neighborhood has streets that end abruptly in every direction. And it's a safety hazard. We have no sidewalks in our neighborhood and families and seniors walk around in the street and are already put at danger from non-residential traffic. All right. And that was Aiden Rodriguez on that one. Let me just reassess my headset. Uh, currently, Rodriguez is dealing with the reality of lack of sidewalks amenities for the area that is already too small, uh, with the street going two to three blocks before stopping completely. If it was the development that was allowed people to enter and leave without impacting the neighborhood, then those issues would not be in play. Because I live next to a commercial development office, Spurgeon, in which you know there's gray strip mall sections and a big enough area to kind of act as a barrier and entry to neighborhoods uh, from reserve. But places like this is just unfeasible because many of the points residents have brought up during this public comment section. Uh, City Council member Christian Jordan, who is out of the Ward 6, which is uh, 
ward representative of this area uh, list the potential issues with the rezoning, and this is what she had to say about this. This rezone does not promote public health and safety. The rezone will increase traffic, noise, chemical smells, artificial light pollution, and lack of natural light from buildings, regardless of buffering for potential um, commercial development within this rezone classification. I'm currently working with multiple neighbors who sit within one block of reserve who've had their quality of life severely affected uh, by some of the noisier or traffic inducing or smell producing or light polluting businesses just across Clark Street. The rezone does not protect neighbors from potential toxic uses allowed within the new classification. And I have tremendous empathy for the neighbor at 2432 South 9th Street West, whose front door sits within 18 feet of the property line. All right. And so those are just some of the uh, responses to this particular development. And uh, surprisingly enough, the city voted against this uh, rezoning in particular area. Uh, Council Jordan says places like this are losing its character as a result, and yet city aims to update the Franklin to the Fort neighbor as most impacted by current growth policies. Uh, the city went back and forth with this for a while and with the city worried about the impact of this area, so they voted against it. And after four hours, this meeting did take some weird places with appointing someone new to the Missoula Redevelopment Agency, but then it becoming a little bit more about the Redevelopment Agency after a substantial black and, uh, back and forth and the ongoing criticism, is, criticism of MRA, the city appointed a new member to the MRA. But uh, in the end of the meeting, the city decided to sound off on current states of homelessness in the city of Missoula, and we have Daniel Colino uh, kicking us off in this subject matter. I am just really disappointed, and this is what we do as a society. For thousands and thousands of years, he could have, you know, sat with a, anybody could have just sat on a piece of grass and been totally fine. But we became so much so advanced as a society that we have a whole team of people to go out there and slash people's tents, arrest people, move them. But we have, we've don't have the advancements to just give them a simple place to be. And that is just really, I don't, I don't even know what, I, what to say about it, but I, I, that is definitely not what the future is going to be like. And I am just hoping that that's what, not what it's going to look like after this urban camping working group. We need to have a more robust system where we have adequate places to tell everybody where they can go safely. But the fact that we have so much resources to, to stop them from just trying to exist is, is really sad. Yep. And this is in response to uh, SCOTUS looking up to um, look how they can um, look at the law when it comes to uh, public camping in public spaces if the uh, facility or the city is not able to uh, um, provide ample um, housing or bedding, which the city of Missoula does uh, accommodate. Uh, pretty much full in the Pavarel Center, and there's always some space in the Johnson Street shelter, but there's not quite enough to accommodate the 500 plus people who are homelessness who are homeless in the city of Missoula. Christian Jordan also talks about this as well, and this is her response. That we are so capable of dehumanizing people who have nothing. Um, my biggest fear right now is that SCOTUS is going to allow cities like ours to criminalize homelessness. Um, I listen to a lot of the deliberations today and the questions have nothing to do with humanity. They have to do with classifications and picking apart things that have nothing to do with looking after our neighbors who don't have as much as they need or deserve. Um, and I do hope that what comes out of the Urban Camping Working Group um, isn't spurned by the potential loss of protections for our homeless community members. All right. And just so you guys know, the Urban Camping Group is a work group that the City of Missoula is inviting residents of the City of Missoula to talk more about homelessness and how they're going to do what they're going to do to uh, help solve these issues. And you know, going even back to Daniel Carlino, the City Council members uh, quote about uh, having a designated space. That's not as easy as you would think because if you're going to provide a space, you have to provide security, safety, insurance, liability, and there's just a lot of weird uh, red tape getting in the way. For for being like, oh yeah, just go here. Oh, I was told to go here by this person, so it's their fault that I'm here in the first place. Boom, boom, boom. It's, yeah, it's it's unnecessarily complicated if you really think about it. And uh, um, City Council Member Mike Nugent talks about uh, how the system is in general. But nobody took the time to say the system is failing. The system is failing everybody, and I think that's unfortunate because 
you know, if I'd been one of the attorneys arguing, I, I might have used my closing to talk about how much I think the federal level and, and states are also failing at this. This is not just a local issue. And one of the things in this work group that, um, you know, has, has come up is it, it's how's the city going to solve it? You know, where can they, where can people stay on city land and stuff like that? You know, there's public land that's not city land. It's state land. There's federal land. There are, there are other groups that should be helping. And, you know, I hear this suggestion of a cleanup under Reserve Street and that MDT is going to let people in and, and do all that. And it's like, that's fine, but that's about the extent of what, in my opinion, the state is actually doing to help solve this, which is next to nothing. Um, and so I, I would like us to see maybe as part of that and there's all the working group that we start putting more pressure on our partners at the federal level and at the state level to say that they are part of the solution as well as us because that um, my takeaway from the grants pads discussion is that it's not going to change anything all right there's mike nugent uh, for the last uh, quote of that night uh, we also have some more meetings um, uh, through the public safety and health uh, something that uh, about White Pine, which is a former lumber mill that operated until 1996. And this is going to be the site of the new Scott Street development with all those new residential parks and more. And these kind of heavy industry sites, especially on the north side, uh, just on the other side of Scott Street, are being developed for residential and mixed use commercial. Tyler Well, Brownfield Community uh, Development Division, talking about some of the cleanup and the site the city will be using for residential development on the north side. And since he is a uh, represents Brownfield, uh, he's going to talk a little bit more about the cleanup. Uh, the site is listed as a state Superfund facility under the authority of the Montana Comprehensive Environmental Cleanup and Responsibility Act. Uh, as I mentioned before, in 2015, the record of decision, uh, DEQ selected a remedy that requires the city to restrict use of the subject properties in order to mitigate the risk to the public health, safety, or welfare of the environment. And DEQ requires that such restrictions be recorded uh, according to law. Uh, part one, page two, and part two, page 68 and 70 and 71 reference is to the record of decision document, which is also available on the agenda. All right. And so as you can see in this particular area, this is Scott Street, pop on the north side, bunch of new neighborhoods popping up over here. I did show a video about the Villaggio and it's really far up here, but you get the kind of sense and um, the idea that they really want to develop a lot of chunk of this site just to uh, build residential, um, expand the neighborhood just in the uh, general vicinity. Um, the site just off of Scott Street, uh, uh, there were some uh, restrictions on the covenants, but overall the site will be able to be developed through grants and various funding sources aimed at redevelopment through Brownfield Sites, which is able to get some of that sweet grant money to help clean up the site. They already dealt with a lot of this in the beginning, where they, uh, especially when I was talking about the Villaggio and a lot of those further north sides of the neighborhoods, uh, they already dealt with a lot of this in the beginning. Uh, when they develop the north side and so this is a continuance of this as they're moving forward with a potential development of the site i believe it's going to be anywhere between 2026 and 2028 when they really uh, start breaking ground so uh, city attorney uh, ryan sudsbury talks about the uh, owners uh, uh, have to clean up the site before they develop in the first place and this is what he had to say about this uh, city parks had actually uh done a lot of work to characterize that site in the in the 2000s maybe early 2010s when they built the park and there was an environmental consultant brought on to do the characterization work necessary to demonstrate to DEQ that the site was safe for residential use and for whatever reason the the consultant failed to sort of complete that process and we can't find the data everybody sort of remembers that it happens even uh, some of the DEQ staff sort of remember that process being initiated but it was never completed so unfortunately we have to redo that work and um, we have already um, looked to engage WGM to finish the work necessary to characterize the soils at the White Pine Park facility so that uh, we can remove the open space recreational use limitation and have it be either allow for commercial use or hopefully we think it should allow for residential use once we complete that process and DEQ is committed that they're bound by law to uh, remove it, institutional controls that aren't necessary which is what Tyler mentioned 
and I, I spoke with their attorney and the and the site manager for the site, and they said, you know, if, if we provide the the data in the form that uh, WGM is planning on presenting, and it shows that it uh, that the site is safe, and we've met the human health criteria applicable to the site, that they're fine removing the institutional controls or amending them to whatever the whatever that data shows is necessary to be protective. So, all right. So that was the uh, kind of like the legalese explanation about how far they're going to go to uh, help clean up this site. Overall, this will not have any financial implications to the city and will be on WGM developers to remove any toxins and provide a, p a private public partnership for this particular site for the safety of human health in this particular area. This is definitely one of those things that they wanted to help uh, clarify before they move forward on this as well. Um, you guys like books? I, I hate to change the subject so randomly, but I actually uh, was lucky enough to uh, be a uh, uh, ho uh, host, uh, somebody from the AAUW used book sale that's happening right now until Sunday. And I'm gonna stop talking and throw it to myself uh, with a special guest, Marilyn uh, Ferris. Uh, so this is Marilyn Ferris. She is one of the board members for the AAUW for a used book sale that's coming out. It's the 63rd annual used book sale that's happening at Orchard Homes, uh, kicking off next Thursday, uh, April 25th, and going on through the weekend. So there's all your informational stuff, and we're going to talk a little bit more about the used okay. book sale. So, Marilyn. Well, um, like you said, it's the 63rd annual book sale this year um, at Orchard Homes, which is just on 3rd Street, the Orchard Homes Clubhouse, and it's been there for a long time. Uh, I think most people know where that is. Um, so the way it works is just by donations. Yep. So we operate on donations, and um, the donations are being taken on Monday and Tuesday yep. only. Um, yep, and we'll put a number down below for those of you who have like a major amount of books, because that's what the Facebook uh, um, uh, information said there's a number that they put down for people who wanted to have more books than you guys can yes yep. yes and those people usually do contact I know that uh, someone from the university has contacted us and they have 25 boxes yeah. of books from one of the museums that they're sending I know that the uh, li the library especially the master library went through some cleaning and stuff like that so if you're looking to do some spring cleaning this is a good opportunity to get rid of some of the uh, old used books absolutely that you've been collecting over the years absolutely um, there are certain books we don't take so I should yes. probably mention that which are textbooks yep. Um, we don't take those. Uh, we don't take encyclopedias anymore. Yeah, because as soon as they're published, they're already out of date. Right, and so and and no one picks them up anymore. So we end up just storing them. We don't take dictionaries and damaged and torn books. We just don't take yeah. anymore. Um, we took them for a long time and stored them for a long time, but it's just not worth it anymore. Yeah. So those are the ones we don't take, but we take everything else. And there are about 20 categories of books. There's, you know, we have a lot of hardcover fiction and paperbacks that takes up about mm. half of one whole room. Um, so there's a lot of those, but then there's categories like self-help and home improvement. Okay. There's a, there's always a big uh, Montana history area Great. and with Montana authors so there's that and then we have a gal who is uh, very experienced in like valuable books oh, and pricing so an valuable books yes that's and good to know yeah and so that's what she pretty much does the whole time is because you know that's the thing about rummage sale is like another person's trash is uh, plenty of opportunities oh, for treasure sure it's, yeah Sure, you might not want it, but somebody else yes. thinks it's great. And then, you know, travel books, uh, there's a poetry section, there are um, history, science, whole animals. So just all those kind of categories. And we also take, uh, have been taking DVDs and mm. CDs and audiobooks. Some people have those. <laughs> Me. And bring those, I know how you feel, Yeah, uh, it's allergy season. Uh, bring those in, so we have been, and they sell. So as long as they're in good shape yeah. and, you know, the CDs aren't missing one or two, um, peop and people love them. And we have a great children's oh. section, too. So any children's books that your kids have grown out of, um, we had a great uh, section of those last Sweet. year. We sold a lot, but we're hoping to get more back. And so we're just really... Um, yeah, and you have all the times and all the dates and... 
all sorts of things happening because they have. Right. So maybe I should go through those. So Monday and Tuesday next week are the donation days, yep. just those two days. And then um, the sale starts on Thursday because it takes us about three days to get all of this yeah. stuff together and out on tables. Um, so the, the sale goes from Thursday through Sunday. Um, starting every day at 10 a.m. Starting every day at 10 a.m. And on the first day it goes until 7. The other days it goes till about 5. Uh, two days, Friday and, and Saturday. And you have a last day special too for yes. those of you who uh, hold out to the very end. Yes, there's, and if you wait till Sunday, there's, uh, uh, it only the book sale only goes until 2. But there is a, it's ten dollar bag sale day. Yep. So any bag that you bring and whatever you can fit into it is ten dollars. Because a lot of times when people are looking through the things, they're looking for like keywords, things that really just kind of sure. pop. But the nice thing about having these brown bags is essentially you're, it's like a present. You don't know what you're gonna get, and you're just right. like, I didn't know I was gonna like this. This is pretty cool. Right. Yeah. This is great. And yeah. so it's really fun because, and it's always a very busy place in the in. Uh, one thing I've noticed is people are so busy looking and reading the backs of books that yeah. it's always very quiet in there. So, you know, people just move from category to category. And so it's a lot of fun. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. And we appreciate the donations from the community. We couldn't do it yep. without that. So we're very grateful for that. Well, thanks for joining me. For yes. Sure. And so Thank another you for reminder, having me. And another reminder for you all, uh, for those looking to donate books, they're doing a donation Monday and Tuesday. Tuesday only. Only. Right. From 10 to 7 p.m. So that whole entire day from what the thing says right. on the schedule. And then Thursday, they're going to kick it off. Right. Uh, be the first ones in to get the, the, the hot picks first. And then right. uh, be the ones at the tail end to see if what you might what, know. Sure. Yeah. What's left. Stuff. Yeah. So it'll, it'll be a lot of fun and we're excited. And it's a lot of fun every year so we see lots of people that we know it's mainly uh, volunteers and it's mostly it's AAUW members but it's also the MMREA which mm -hmm. is the or sorry WMREA Western Montana retired teachers okay. is what it and so a lot of those people volunteer and volunteer their hours and it, and it all works out nice yeah so it's a lot of fun yeah, thanks for joining us yes thank you yeah, so much going on this weekend and more as we're uh, basically a week away from the farmer's market. I'll remind you again during my uh, um, events talk, but we're going to kick things off with a little thing I like to call pre-critic, where I pre-judge a movie based on absolutely nothing but my pre-biases towards movies in general. Hey, you like those ridiculous shoot em up kind of action movies where violence is so over the top it becomes comical? Enjoy one of the Skarsgård brother movies, Boy Kills World. From the one chapter... Uh, to two from the uh, It chapter movies. Uh, Bill Skarsgård fights for his survival and revenge in the world turned upside down by a dystopian fascist future regime with only the narrative choice of Bob Burgers, a.k.a. Archer from Archer, a.k.a. Uh, H. John Benjamin uh, from the Wet Hot American Summer as the voice of the can of peas. Uh, this movie is one of those creative swings. Most movies tend to lean towards predictable plot, but this one is a little bit uh, touch and go as the trailer shows a young kid who is wronged, damaged, and forever changed to rise against society that trivializes human lives. And so this movie is basically just like um, uh, The Running Man, but not. Anyways, up next we have, oh, nope, right there. We got this movie called Challengers. Um, honestly, the if I were to sum this up in just um, a couple words, it's just Zendaya's excuse to have a threesome. Uh, but, you know, th th in a way, uh, she tries to convince boyfriend Tom Holland to have a three-way, but you know uh, it, it also has to do with tennis. So tennis is kind of like going to take a backseat to this movie about this uh, menage a trois between Zendaya and these two other guys that whatever. Uh, so anyways, there's a lot of back and forth love triangle where it in, where the end, she will choose the exciting choice because the most boring one will probably be along for the ride and hopefully realize that tennis and Zendaya isn't everything. Something tells me that Zendaya will use some feminine wiles to throw off the other guy while her squeeze tries at anything to win tennis, but maybe make it worse for both of them. And in my head canon, the bros bro down down and dumps in day and hang out with Tom Holland in the end. Finally, we have um, Breathe. Uh, this movie kind of follows the same path of Earth being described as a wasteland where survivors must survive. Breathe is gimmicky because they have to go to each different planet to uh, find 
oxygen reserves and the two ladies a mother and daughter must find the air before the air runs out and find their dad who is the king of the air for some reason i'm not sure but i think they'll have uh, run-ins with other people wanting to take the air and find a bigger world where air can trade and have special air bars that fights break out and anything i don't know the gal from resident evil in this is in this movie doing her uh, normal uh, kung fu thing or whatever i don't know it seems like it's very dramatic um and then we have uh unsung hero you know every everyone likes an inspirational movie about uh what they uh, uh inspirational movies and what do they have in common tragedy what brings people together enjoy a nice christian movie where uh, you heathen uh, children could finally get how hard your god-fearing mother means when she says ask jesus not jeeves i stole that joke from another show but this mo movie is that stars a mother of nine has a balance of God, family, and more in this inspiration movie since Hallmark doesn't do Jesus stuff. Oh, what a shame. Uh, <laughs> humane. Uh, so essentially this movie is a little less about large families and a lot about reducing population, stave off starvation and supply chain issues in an alternate look at how far people are willing to go in charge and willing to keep the way they have their normal lives while also reducing everything else in the world for the rest of us. This movie follows uh, the patriarch of a family being like, you know what, I I'm good. I I if I die, then you guys will be taken care of and everyone's doing it, so we're gonna do it anyway. So however this drama follows this family as they deal with this drama in a world that seems to be cheapening human lives. Sound familiar? When one of the volunteers backs out, of uh, we draw straws of an intense standoff with government officials looking for bodies. But I'm pretty sure that uh, how it'll end is that they uh, turn the tables on the government officials and be like, hey, we got a quota. Boop, 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 next house. I don't know. It's weird. It's one of those movies that are very like quirky and uh, they're, they're, they're dramatic, but it comes off as like, wait, is this a satire? But anyways, up next we have a satirical version of a, a 1958 movie, The Two-Headed Spy, where I redub over this movie. And without further ado, here is The, t uh, the Two-Headed Spy from the 1958 movie. Well, my heart goes out to you. I'd hate it too if all my Hoopistank albums went missing. I, it is quite frustrating to deal with this kind of stuff. But I am trying my best to find oh, out... Oh, are you sure it wasn't some kind of prank? You know how us Germans like comedy. Hmm, it's funny that you mentioned that our style of humor is more reactionary to the absurd, not necessarily the, uh, uh, what are you trying to say? You must wonder why I brought you here in the first place, for I have evidence. Uh, great, now you can find out who did this and reprimand them for what they did. Oh! Oh, I intend to, all right. I'm going to do it really good to them. We can't expect these pranksters to be crawling in the dark and expect to get away with it. We're going to shine a spotlight on them. I'm not the perfect person, but I do know when I'm being wronged. And this situation... Oh, no, no, no. No, I can't believe this. <laughs> oh, believe it as you must, mister. Listen, if you're going to come at me accusing me, you better have some proof, some realistic proof. I think you better call Heinz and have him explain what's going on here. Oh, I'm glad you suggested that. I'll be more than glad to call Heinz. <laughs> oh, I'm calling Heinz right now. I'm dialing the number. Oh, he didn't answer. Uh, so what do we do? We wait for him to call back. As a proud German, I can say that Hubastank really talks to us. Oh, there he, there he is. Oh, hi, Heinz. <clears throat> I'm really busy with ketchup here. Oh, hello, Heinz. I have some questions about our esteemed guest, our soldier, our man in arms. You really like beating the bush, don't you, Heinrich? Just get on with it already. I am building a very powerful tomato-based condiment, and if you keep on interrupting me like this, I will come right over to you, and I will ruin you. I will end your life right here and right now, because if this call is about Hoobastank, I will kill you. Oh no, this is more related to a uh, spy in the German army. No, no, it wasn't about Hoobastank. That wasn't the last draw. I was going to get them, I swear. I just needed proof. Bring in two Venus Vitzels right now. I'm not a perfect person, but 
I know it when somebody's betrayed me, for you've done all sorts of kind of things behind our back here in the German army, and I'm here to prosecute you at the full extent of the German law. Uh, yeah. No, no, you don't. Alright, hey guys, welcome back. We're going to jump into some events that are happening in and around the city of Missoula. Kicking things off for your event-filled uh, weekend, uh, ki kicking off this morning especially, is Stroller Strides with the Mommy and Me kind of workout class at Bonner Park. They do this every Friday, most mornings at 9.30 a.m. Uh, also, we got the Missoula Butterfly House and then the Sectarian, they have open hours at 10 a.m. They usually have a butterfly release of some of their new butterflies around 10.30 a.m., depending upon if they're ready to uh, uh, come out of the chrysalis. Uh, Missoula Food Bank and meal distribution opens at 10 a.m., goes until about 1 p.m. most Fridays. They have longer hours on Tuesdays and Thursdays for people to uh, be able to get uh, fresh and nutritious food uh, without breaking the bank. It is a, a food uh, service and a meal distribution center. Uh, they also do a thing with the library in the afternoons through Lego Club. Introduction to Soldering, a lifelong learning center, um, is uh, one of their many different um, items. Soldering is a great tool for people who want to make their own jewelry and more. Lifelong Learning Center in general is a great uh, additional education class for people who just want to pay per class and not pay for a whole education experience. Uh, Tiny Tales at Missoula Public Library starting at 10.30 a.m. This is every Friday. They do story time on Saturdays at 10.30. Uh, the difference is Tiny Tales uh, skews a little bit more towards uh, hands-on activities versus story time, which is more about somebody who uh, leads a reading group in front of a bunch of kids. Lunch at the Missoula Senior Center. Missoula Senior Center hosts a lunch every weekday at 11.30 a.m. along with the Pavarella Center is also doing their own lunch at uh, every single day at 11.30 for meal distribution. They also do breakfast and dinner. Yarns at Missoula Public Library. This is a great people f f way for people to stitch, crochet, make their own clothing, yarn, knit, and all that kind of stuff. Every Saturday, every Friday at uh, um, 12 noon on the fourth floor in the uh, Blackfoot Board Meeting meet Room. And like I said, Lego Club also has after school meals in conjunction with the Missoula Food Bank. And as we get towards the end of May, we'll have free lunches for those 18 and younger here host at the Missoula Public Library and also at the Missoula Food Bank. Uh, youth, art, a youth Adult Writers Group, if you're into literature and you want your kid who is very creative to kind of hash it out and learn to write, uh, the library hosts a young r adult writers group every Friday at 3.30 p.m. And then as we jump further in, we're going to have uh, the uh, Blibby, uh, the uh, Wonderful World Tour. So Blibby is uh, uh, coming to Missoula for the ultimate curiosity adventure in, in Blibby, the Wonderful World Tour. So imagine the Wiggles, very kid-friendly, very song and dance and learn Blibby, Blibby. And special guest Mika, as they, d they discover what makes uh, different cities unique and special, there'll be monster trucks, excavators, and garbage trucks galore. You bet. It's kind of like Bob the Builder, but it's like a modern Bob the Builder because there's always some f things for that. But warning, this is a kid-centric event like the Wiggles and Bob the Builder. So. Also uh, happening tonight is a folk music at Imagination Brewing Company uh, featuring Chris uh, Pumphrey. Um, we got Rebecca Kelly of Strumming Bird Vegavon at Highlander Beer Folk Music. Um, Zool, uh, Z uh, Jazz Zula is going to be hope hosted at Zach Zootown Arts Community Center this weekend starting at 6.30 p.m. Uh, Martha Scanlon and John Newfield at the Wilma is going to be playing some folk music at the Wilma Theater. Raised by Wolves is going to be uh, multi-genre music at the Old Post uh, starting at 7 p.m. And then uh, since it's the last, uh, the fourth Friday of, of, of the month, the Four History Buff is going to be uh, uh, doing a uh, lecture talk after hours at the Missoula Public Library uh, starting at 7 p.m. Uh, it's called Beyond School Marms and Madams, and so you get to learn a little bit of history of that and more. And also Disney's Beauty and the Beast is going to be playing at the MCT this weekend. Uh, it's a colorful collection of fantasy fairy tales featuring some of Disney's most beloved characters and greatest musical numbers. They'll be featuring it this weekend and next weekend and beyond as MCT will be uh, wrapping up their... Uh, Missoula uh, Community Theater season for the summer of summer camps and fun for the kids who want to get into the theater. A 40 over 40 at Westside Theater. This is dance centric for people who are 40 to try to get back into the rhythm and motion and all that kind of stuff at Westside Theater starting at 7.30 p.m. Bright Star is going to be at the University of Montana. They're doing their theater and dance in school are proud to present Bright Star 
from uh, uh, throughout this weekend. And this is part of their dramatic musical features, books and stories by Steve Martin, music, lyrics and stories by Eddie Brickwell. Uh, inspired by a true story, Bright Star tells a sweeping tale of love and redemption set against the backdrop of Appalachia in the 1920s and 40s. And so it's their last week and you want to check it out. Travis Yost at Cranky Sam playing acoustic music at 8 p.m. G Space presents uh, Dark Matter is going to be playing some hip hop and more at the Monk's Bar at 9 p.m. Uncle Funk is going to be playing some funk music at Union Club, a place that things to dance to. And like I said uh, earlier in the show, uh, we got Saturday one more week into the OG Farmers Market kicks off May 4th in downtown Missoula area from 8 a.m. to about 1 p.m. Bunch of vendors, bunch of different kinds of things, all that kind of fun stuff happening. We also have some indoor fun for Mismo Gymnastics um, and also Missoula YMCA um, Saturday morning, started at nine ish in the morning. Uh, forestry days at Fort Missoula. So, this is where they're going to be doing uh, cutting a lot of trees, climbing up on a lot of wood, and uh, held at the uh, Montana Historic Equipment Area and the Garnet Grothen Memorial Arena at the Historic Museum of Fort Missoula, brought to you by the Society of American Foresters and UM. Uh, Woodsman team. This is a timber sports event that you won't want to miss. And so that's happening all weekend long, Saturday and Sunday, starting at 9.30 a.m. But the big day is tomorrow. Uh, Wild Wander, springtime at Fort Missoula at the uh, Svalen Island. Um, Montana Natural History Center is uh, teaming up with Fort Missoula and for uh, they saunter through the Fort Missoula native plant garden speaking uh, to the variety of plants and uh, with their either food or medicine within the uh, within, before skipping down the secret garden that is uh, Slevin's Island along the Clark Fork River to greet many a uh, fresh spring green. And then we jump into story time at the Missoula Public Library at 10.30 a.m. on Saturday. Uh, we have a museum tour at the Missoula Art Museum with, uh, that also includes a teen open studio for teens looking to get into art, have uh, art provided, and have lunch too at 12.30 every Saturday at the Missoula Art Museum. And then also MCAT does uh, the MCAT Saturday drop-in until the end of May. This is from 1 to 3 p.m. MCAT hosts a Saturday drop-in for kids to do stop animation, make movies, and more. Uh, Learn to Hunt Montana. Uh, the Montana Nature History Center is during a Learn to Hunt starting at 1 p.m. They also have kid activities featuring Missoula Rocks um, at the Montana History Center at 1 p.m. They're doing a lot as they're kicking off through their summer season. Earth Week, all under one roof. The Missoula Public Library is uh, hosting... Um, Valerie Bayer and Catherine uh, uh, said an even Demi of Northern Rocking uh, Nature Journaling for another adult class on nature journaling. They'll continue exploring the techniques and joys of nature journaling. That's going to be at 1.30 p.m. It'll probably be in the fourth floor, but you want, want to check with the library staff about more information about this either today or tomorrow. It starts at 1.30 p.m. on Saturday. Predator feeding, Missoula Butterfly House does a predator feeding Saturdays at 3.30 p.m. You get to see how bugs uh, eat other bugs. Uh, free swing dance lessons at the Jack Saloon, uh, do, featuring country music at 5 p.m. Superhero Skates, they're doing the first uh, 70 kids through the door will receive a free cape and mask at the Glacier Ice Rink starting at 5.30 p.m. Jules Quinn is going to be uh, playing some folk music at Imagination Brewing Company starting at 6 p.m. Odd Pitch is going to be hosting a glam rock karaoke at 6 p.m. Uh, Jazula is going to be continuing from Friday night to Saturday night at 6.30 p.m. at the Zootown Arts Community Center. Sundog North at the Draftworks uh, playing some bluegrass music. Nashville 406 at the Jack Saloon playing some country music. Um, Julian Pianos with Josh Farmer and Kyle Curtis at Save and Hoop starting at 8 p.m. Solid State Karaoke at Westside Lanes and Fun Center at 9 p.m. Monk's Bar is hosting electronic music. Uh, Ardelen, Ardelen, uh, Vandalay Industries. Anyways, Ardelen is going to be uh, playing at the Monk's Bar at 9 p.m. Jackson Holt is going to be at Union Club at 9 p.m. Uh, Mikey Lyon at the Top Hat is going to uh, was rescheduled to the Top Hat at 10 p.m. on Saturday night. Um, DJ Chris Moon is going to wrap up your night at uh, the Badlander at 10 p.m. Uh, on Saturday night. And then uh, if you're interested in keeping chickens and because, uh, you know, the city of Missoula allows for having chicken coops within the city limits and urban areas. So Blue Mountain Flowers, uh, this is off of uh, 1890, uh, 1829 Trail Street, Missoula is going to be hosting a, a city chickens workshop where they experiences over the years and their flocks and they raised here in Missoula to cover topics such as raising chicken coops need. Um, types of feed, common problems, chicken enrichment, and more. This workshop will be uh, begin at the Blue Mounds Flowers Farm to take a look at the homemade coop and gain insight from Caitlin's beautiful chickens. 
So that's what's going to be happening on Sunday at uh, 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 10 a.m. And then we're going to have Donald Trump Jr. at 1 p.m. at the EUC Ballroom at 3 p.m. I don't know why my voice got a little bit more excited, but it's, uh, it's, it's just what it is. But yeah, he's coming to uh, Sunday, so you... <laughs> in the UC Ballroom level three, and you can purchase tickets online, which are uh, uh, exorbitant. Anyways, uh, the uh, JDRF1 Walk Missoula uh, Paddlehead Stadium, they're going to do a walk, the annual Cure Diabetes, which will be held Sunday, April 28th at Oregon Park, starting at 2 p.m. Registration begins at noon. This is a three-mile walk between 2 p.m. with a barbecue and raffle prizes afterwards. This will be the walk in the beautiful River Trail in Missoula, Montana. And then Sunday, the Montana Natural History Center is hosting Scavengers Photography Club. And this is from 6 to 8 p.m. And the community inspiration for your nature of photography passion at the Scavengers Photography Club. Everyone is welcome, hobbyists, enthusiasts, professionals, and new beginners. And they're going to do all sorts of fun stuff over there on Sunday night, starting at 6 p.m. Gabriel Iglesias is going to be a uh, comedian. If you don't know him, he's fluffy. Um, he's going to be doing a comedy show starting at 7 p.m. at the Adams Center. And Matthew Jack Biley and Friends is going to be uh, playing some rock music at Zootown Arts Community Center. And if you want some off-the-cuff humor for an open mic, uh, VFW hosts a comedy open mic every Sunday at 8 p.m. And then Sunday Saloon is doing karaoke at Sunday at 8.30 p.m. All those things you don't want to miss. But here is another fun thing that you don't want to miss as well. It here is featuring some of the uh, kooky kids from Lowell School uh, doing their own stop animation that uh, they came a uh, last uh, couple months, so here's a compilation of all their uh, efforts. Uh, and be wary, they were only here for maybe five, ten minutes just to get a, a glimpse of it, but I was able to make a compilation for you guys. <laughs> That'll get your blood pumping. And uh, speaking of getting your blood pumping, you know, uh, here's some news things that are happening in around the city of Missoula and Montana. Uh, House Bill 442 failed after months of being litigated since the 2023 legislation session. The House bill, if passed, would have allocated that marijuana money and made Montana towards uh, conservation roads, trails, and veteran programs. Uh, to name a few, but Governor Gianforte took issue with the bill and vetoed it on the 11th hour, forcing this litigation to take place. There's some context. However, much of the litigation time did not bear fruit other than the motivation to get the votes to override the veto failed of 14 to 2, which the governor said, I applaud the Montana legislature for today rejecting the radical uh, judicial overreach as the court sought to meddle in the legislative process, end quote. It is not 
been the first time the courts have dealt with many laws passed over the years with the uh, students suing the state for a clean and livable climate along with abortion policies that failed because Montana's privacy laws. Uh, the Montana Wildlife uh, Federation, Wild Mizzou Montana and Montana Association of Counties claim, uh, quote, delay tactics and per political maneuvers, end quote, the governor used to thwart the veto override push and pledged to introduce similar legislation with the legislature uh, convenes in 2025. And so right now the money will go to a general fund among uh, addiction treatment, parks and trails, and habitat work. So this was basically kind of like, uh, they wanted to create this bill to help really allocate a lot of this money, but uh, when they originally were drafting this and having the um, creation of this marijuana uh, legalization in the state of Montana, they're just throwing it to random things here and there into the general fund in general. But then they realize it's like, oh, now we can uh, put, now we have some real money coming in through the state and we can use this for one thing or another. And then right now, it's just kind of like they push the lines for their, of just kind of continuing doing what they've just been doing. The Supreme Court is weighing on the uh, homeless encampments in public places when shelters are full. They talked a little bit about this in Durham City Council, how they're appalled about the potential decision. And this is something the city of Missoula and many communities have done into trying to mitigate encampments that started popping up at the Johnson Street shelter closed for spring through the summer. Advocacy groups argue that allowing cities to punish people who need a place to sleep will criminalize homelessness and ultimately make the crisis worse as the cost of housing increases. So maybe not make housing so expensive in rent. Not to mention people who are in the less than zero Zero status tend to not be able to afford tickets that were once issued for illegal camping in the first place. Many examples from across the nation came to a head in 2018, which saw fines as high as $295 per ticket in rural Oregon towns, which saw a major federal lawsuit, which resulted in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which we uh, finally got to just this last year, where that's where uh, public encampments, if the uh, towns are unable to provide adequate shelter, the people can shelter in public spaces. Uh, and so that's why we had such a major issue. And they could legally do that, even though we don't feel comfortable with them doing that. So SCOTUS will decide this uh, matter by the end of June. And so this is something that's kind of on the horizon. And the city is looking intently at this as they're also working through the urban camp uh, working group going as well. So uh, a new invention of a global cooling is making news via NPR and it seems like a precursor to offset carbon emissions. But what started out as a giant mirror reflecting sunlight to offset global warming effects in weather patterns changing in recent years has become a couple of guys popping balloons in the atmosphere. Metal tanks full of helium sulfur dioxide gas filled with these balloons uh, up to be popped when it gets too high with the altitude and the pressure, the uh, sulfur dioxide, which is layered with the atmosphere at about six to 30 miles above the Earth's surface. When the balloon pops, the sulfur dioxide gas turns into particles reflecting enough sunlight, the company says, to offset the warming of 175 gas-powered vehicles for a year. So the, uh, the gear towards funding, this is an organization called Make Sunsets and their campaign to $1.2 million as of Monday when the uh, story dropped. However, the U.S. Israeli startup called Stardust Solutions that uh, plans on someday launching reflective particles into the stratosphere has raised $15 million according to Chief Executive Officer and Co-Founder Yanel Yav uh, Yavab. Uh, Stardust inventors include Solar Edge, an Israeli green energy company, and uh, Oz Ventures as Israeli-Canadian Venture Capital Fund that highlights its website, a partnership with Israel's Ministry of Defense. And so as we get a little bit further into this, it's kind of interesting how we're even talking about Israel in general because it's very much like how we transition. And... Um, yeah, and th just this last week, uh, a major war package for Israel, Ukraine, and even Taiwan got passed with $95 billion. And so far, from as a response, a lot of college campuses across the United States kicking off with Columbia, where uh, even their own president decided to throw their own students on the bus by allowing the police to essentially stop the protest. So instead of uh, kind of reacting, be like, oh yeah, you keep doing your protest, whatever, they just decided to uh, be like, oh, we need the police like right away to stop this going. And so that's definitely an very interesting kind of situation going on here. And uh, so far, there's been a lot of campuses across the United States that have been definitely cracking down on a lot of these protests. And it's kind of funny because we're uh, at the anniversary of the Kent State, um, not to mention, uh, I, I heard it, and also an interesting fun fact as well is that uh, in 68 was the premiere of Planet of the Apes, and yet we're having another Planet of the Apes uh, coming out this year. But, you know, that's just some trivial knowledge for sure. But overall, these protests have hit a nerve, and as a result, 
a potential National Guard was being floated as a deterrent for these protests. So I kind of want to end it there. I have nothing more uh, I can say because I don't have enough time in my show. So I wanted to thank you guys for joining me. And for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ramph.